go. Great. So hi, folks. Welcome to the Network Centric Resources online discussion. Um, our Network Centric Resources project supports the development of participatory resources, which are knowledge assets for networks and communities that share ownership, enable contribution, and support collaboration. The online discussion series highlights lessons learned from resource developers in enabling co-creation. So I'm your host, Dirk Slater, and I am the fab writer in Fab Writers. And joining me today is Heather Leeson, Data Literacy Lead at the International Feb Federation of the Red Cross Red Crescent Societies. Hello, Heather. Hey, Dirk, and hi, everybody. Thanks for joining, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening for you. Um, just very quickly, the International Federation of Red Cross Red Crescent Societies um, is a global international organization. <coughs> We work with dogs and 190 national, 91 national societies around the world. Um, a national society could be like the Canadian Red Cross or PMI in Indonesia. Um, we also have 11.6 million volunteers. So imagine talking about data with all of those people. And, and we will imagine awesome. that. Even, imagine. Even right. that more deeply. Great. So um, for those of you that are participating here, some points you want to know. Firstly, uh, um, uh, I have tried earlier to alert people to the chat room and I, I just want to do it again, just so you know. So if you do hover down to the bottom, that is my dog, God bless her. Um, if you do hover down to the bottom of the, the, of the chat room with your cursor, you will, you will see a menu and in that you will see um, uh, something called chat. And if you click on that, you should see a chat room open on the right hand side of your screen. If you could do us a favor, type hello, and also uh, please type in just a, a quick, quick sentence of why you came today. We would really appreciate that. Um, uh, we are going to make you in play in just a little bit, um, and I'm gonna get to that. Um, but um, uh, the way that uh, um, this is gonna work for today, so firstly, we're, we've had these introductions. Then what's going to happen actually in just a few minutes and through the magic of Zoom, um, I'm going to get you guys all to talk to each other for just a few minutes, um, specifically about what you want to get out of this discussion and what challenges you're facing in uh, co-creating participatory resources. Um, then you're going to hear Heather and I, and we're going to talk to each other about um, creating the data playbook and it being in beta. Um, and then we're going to answer your questions. And again, if you want to uh, type any questions or comments, you can do that in the chat room. Um, but when we get to the questions, um, we might actually ask you to come off mute and, and do that live. I'm excited about that. Um, uh, and then we'll wrap up by sharing some resources and what is happening for this project, for both, both of our projects. Heather and I work together on this product, project called the Data Playbook. And what I want to do is actually get Heather to start um, by talking about, um, uh, 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 talking about um, the challenges that when you started thinking about the Data Playbook, like what, what were the challenges that you thought um, the Data Playbook should be addressing? What were you trying to, what problems were you trying to solve? Sure. So, um, you know, there's a lot of data courses out there and data science courses and just a plethora of that. And so in the humanitarian space, I was a volunteer. I'm on the board of humanitarian, was on the board of humanitarian on the street map. I'd encounter all these humanitarians. And when I was working in research, I really just felt like there was a big gap between all that kind of amazing stuff happening in the data science world and then what it really means to fit into workflows every day. So when I arrived at the Red Cross Red Crescent in, in, in 2016, I pitched that we have a data playbook. And I did it for a couple of reasons. I'm really interested in what Atlassian did with their team handbook. I love the DIY toolkit, the idea of mixing recipes and social learning. From what I learned from running events and open source technology and all across is that the social learning is where we can get the special spot, especially when you're talking about people who are potentially afraid of data and technology. So how do we kind of build that conversation? So really it was about how do we take the data skills to scale? scale? And I also wanted to get an ecosystem map of Who's doing this stuff? I have like, you know, as I said, 191 national societies, 11.6 million volunteers. It's a global organization working in health, cash transfer, wash, emergency response. 
I knew that there was stuff everywhere, but the playbook became like the way to convene that knowledge, collect that knowledge and find those ambassadors and then make a common uh, set of it. So instead of building out training manuals, I said, what do you got out there? And so I just asked a lot of questions. And so by doing that, I was able to one, find my audience, two, connect the leaders, three, kind of co-create and pilot content, and then four, come to the point where we're at the beta. So really the challenge is about the fact that we have everything from the data curious to the data ready. And I would even say um, the data deniers and the data hostile. I, Heather, I'm saving lives. What do, you, what do you mean data stuff? And so there's a lot of barriers and opportunities to be able to kind of talk about data as part of information. And so what we like to say is data is information, which may lead to knowledge and decisions. And so we basically took the concepts of what was out there already, tried to fill in the gaps, but we didn't use, um, as, as Bob is doing with the, his library, we never put a computer in front of it. We use paper, pens, sticky notes, critical thinking. And so by making it a safe place to learn and having a lot of fun, there's always food at our events. There's always like, uh, you know, exercises. Um, what we tried to do is try and complement um, the existing training out there, the more professional technical training, like open data kit or mobile data kit, uh, like, or other mobile data kit projects, um, and kind of complement that kind of more high end thing with the gaps around what is this data thing? How do we incorporate it in our work? What are some of the best practices? So that's kind of the challenge we tried to address. And yeah. just, you know, quite, quite a mess, but we did, we did an interesting job on that. To uh, sort that. Mm -hmm. Good, and a really critical thing, I think, to point on, because, um, and I, I was gonna do this anyways, but Heather Cooper, um, um, I, uh, I did get your name right. Why mm -hmm. am I back? Heather, not, not you, you, the, ah, ah, um, why am I doing this? Anyways, um, the thing I, I, I really wanted to pull out, and um, uh, Heather Cooper has uh, put this up in the, as, a, as a question, this idea of social learning. So, mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that that um, um, Heidi, Heidi, um, one of the things that I have um, uh, uh, really learned a lot from in working on this pro project is the connection between or why social learning is important for data literacy, and um, I think this bit that you were you're going at uh, for you know trying to get teams to better. Uh, communicate with each other around data and to better understand each other um, by interacting around data. This is the point with where the social learning comes in and why it is so critical. So, you know, if you are thinking about what is data literacy, for me, one of the things is data literacy means you understand the ecosystem involved in working on a data project, right? Mm -hmm. And with the way that you've done it, or the way that you, uh, this works with the social learning piece, particularly in the data playbook, is you're getting those teams to come together and learn together, right? So everything that is uh, in there that are exercises, scenarios, things like that, are ways for teams to come together and work together and build their data literacy together. And that also participatory social learning. So in terms of that, that question, Heidi, about that, what is social learning? It is really about bringing people together to learn together in a, in a very participatory way. Yeah, and I, if I could just add, I mean, the, the Red Cross, Red Crescent, our first aid programs are all about social learning, right? Our health community health programs are all about social learning. Volunteers who are teaching each other, and yes, there's some practices and they have the, some curriculum, but it's really about community volunteers leading, and that's, that's truly something that's part of our, our culture. So I took the methods of that, that culture and applied it for how do we use data and technology. So I'm, I'm starting to call it digital therapy or data therapy a little bit, you know, and I know that's been used by other folks too, but in a way, or data first aid, in a way by doing it that way, we're able to kind of make the comparison between what people know and how they learn and how they learn something hard using our best skills. And I want to be super clear that one of the powers of social learning is that um, we never hired one person for training for a good full year and a half of this program. I walked around and found out who had the skills and used what I had. And I, I was able to do that. And so when I say that just in the Geneva office, but it was also around the world, right? So by using the internet and using what we have, we were able to kind of co-create at a different level, which again, kind of goes into the, what do you do in a large global network with super talented people? 
how do you help the rest who, who has some data gaps but have other skills? And I think the other, the other thing too that's really powerful about what you did in terms of the co-creation is that you, um, it, it, you, you, um, you didn't do the, okay, so we're building this and now you're going to use it. You did the like, here's stuff that you're already using, right? Here's, here's things that we know are already working. Mm-hmm. And also within that, you know, picking up the, the things that people had already been doing themselves, you were yeah. in a way creating confidence or building confidence yeah. within those teams that yes. they're actually doing stuff, right? Yeah. The organizational confidence and trust is absolutely core. Um, I mean, we are dealing with, again, such a wide berth of people who, like people who are in the DRC doing the Ebola response right now to people in Cox Bazaar. Some of those people who are leading the information workflows for that are people who contributed their best of, right? And so I can't say it enough. There were hundreds of contributors across every sector and volunteers around the world who made this happen, who, you know, I just, I started just with spreadsheets and documents and said, hi, this is what I've got, what's missing. And then that kind of community gap analysis was really important. And then when we brought Dirk on, uh, we really, we really took those principles of let's work radically in the open. Let's do some human centered design. And we checked in, we ran a sprint. Um, you know, we checked with everybody in terms of that. And, you know, ideally I would have loved to do that sprint in a number of places. And I, I actually was able to do some of that pre sprint before Dirk arrived um, to come and help us uh, really just focusing on, um, you know, I ended up in Nairobi and Kuala Lumpur and Nepal um, where I was able to pilot it. And then my colleagues took it to the Americas and to Panama and Costa Rica and piloted it in Honduras and piloted the content. And so we, we were creating stuff, that, the stuff that was already existing, we refined. And then all the while we were finding gaps and creating new content. And so by the time we, we got to um, January of this year, we had a massive amount of content that needed to be kind of distilled into exercises, scenarios, some games, some checklists, hi puppy, some checklists and, and, and some slides. And so we had amassed all of that, but it was more about putting it into a way that could be used. And when I say used, 30 minute to one hour exercises um, that could be used around the world and be translated. And so that's where we're at right now. And again, just to say that we did a massive kind of consultation across all the different sectors. Um, and, you know, we pi- kept piloting and testing as we went. And I can probably tell you a little bit more about that in a second. Dirk, next question. Yeah, no. So I actually want to, um, and, and also just get back and highlight for people a couple of mm-hmm. things that mm-hmm. happened within this process. So mm-hmm. one thing, so um, you've just mentioned, um, it's okay, you've, we, we can watch you drink. Um, uh, it's the holiday party, that, or a festive party there, anyways. There is a festive party, but I'm drinking water. Thanks for asking. Good. Um, <laughs> anyway, sorry. So the, um, the, the sprint, right? So pretty early on, or it, w- it was actually later on, but early on in my part of when, when you brought me on, we mm-hmm. did a week-long sprint there in the Geneva's offices. And so mm-hmm. basically what, um, you know, for those of you who are wondering, that week was us um, in a room very similar to the one that you are in right now, in the the uh, IFRC offices where we were inviting people to come by and to give us inputs, right? And so the first part of that week, uh, you and I really focused on developing um, um, some um, user profiles, right? And and thought through this concept of um, the data uh, data curious, um, the data ac- advocate. Um, I'm blanking. The data, data advocate. curious, data advocate, data data ready, and data active. Data active, right? Yeah. And so thinking, um, also have you know, getting those profiles up and thinking about how what we were doing was going to be speaking to those types of people. So as people were coming through um, that office, you and I were asking them, okay, react to this, right? Here's some stuff mm-hmm. on the wall. React to this, and that was really critical. Um, and then the other piece, after we'd, we'd done all that, we then um, started looking at the pieces that were already there. So all mm-hmm. the little pieces that would become part of the data playbook, um, we got those represented in post-it notes up on the wall, and we are actually getting people to tell us what they thought was absolutely critical um, for this first version and all that. So we were getting a lot of input during that week by just people yeah. coming through and working with them during yeah. the room. 
Yeah, and so around before that and around that and after that, I kept getting more input because we were running skills scoping exercises around the world. And so that gave us a chance to find out where the gaps were, what skills do people want to learn, what skills they want to share, and what their priorities were. And so we had to make some business decisions about what's out there already, but also about where our, where, what content we had. Um, and that's why it's a beta. Um, and so with the beta, once we, once we did the sprint, then we went through numerous iterations about how do we make this just an MVP, a minimal file product in terms of how it looked. And then what do all the different templates and counterparts look like to get me to um, all the pilots that I had to do this year, um, which, uh, which is a huge opportunity because the idea of, 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 of collating the content into palatable pieces and then going back and making sure that we're, we're doing that all the while people are still creating um, based on the methodology. So they're creating scenarios, which I created four different scenarios this year, which aren't in the playbook yet. If I'm on the phone, sorry. Um, four different, it's, it's a business office, it's gonna happen. Um, so we created four different scenarios just for the pilots this fall because we needed to serve that particular audience. But the methodology of here's some templates that can fit in that we can reuse, we've taught that, right? So we've taught the engine um, and taught the process about this is how we're gonna format content so that it can end up in version one if needed. In addition, um, we, we, we discovered with our pilots, which we had in the cash transfer program, which is one of the largest programs in the world in terms of localizing humanitarian response, monitoring and evaluation, health, which is pandemic preparedness, as well as other health programs, and then emergency response surge. So I mentioned the DRC and, 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 and what's happening in Cox Bazaar. So those, the content is living and breathing and getting used. In fact, it was getting used before it was even a beta project, and it's getting used quite heavily, especially this fall. We've had some tailored workshops, but my whole goal with this is, is that data is part of everyone's job, and we wanted to reach and solve the problem with them, so we've embedded the content into key programs um, so that we can create those advocates across the different programs. So instead of having data as just on a little island, we said, okay, no, you must talk about, you know, you're going to do your healthcare program. You need to talk about data protection before you talk about tools. And so, or you need to talk about what is data before you talk about data protection. And so putting it and embedding it to the stack is the most important thing about the pilots is because if, if we create content that's not useful and usable as immediately, then we're not solving the problem. But this also helped us to identify with this beta what, what could happen next. And this is where the exciting thing is, is that we, because we have these like nine modules that again are the exercises, checklists, slides, and scenarios, um, what we found is we've tailored it for the trainers. So if you look at the audience and you, if you look at the content, it's humanitarian based. And um, it, the audience is definitely for people who, who are working in training. Um, we made it with a Creative Commons license because we want to white label it so that people can reuse it. And we are finding that people are contacting us and, and the people who signed up, whether you're listening now or listening later, um, you all come from different perspectives and different sectors, right? And this is where I think some really exciting work can happen. Um, but I constantly, and I said this yesterday when I was at a, 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 an event with ICRC, that um, you know, we, we use Oxfam stuff for responsible data. We use all the training materials out there that we can to serve our audience because the audience is so diverse. But we're looking to build next um, data for volunteers and embed that into the health program. So again, those volunteers who are teaching first aid right in the field or who are their first responders, um, there are certain or different countries around the world. And then the data from managers, those are kind of our next ones. But because we have 190 national societies, we're such a large organization, we need a digital and data upgrade. So we're also looking at how do we help national societies incorporate that. So we've taken the beta and we've asked, um, so the Canadian Red Cross has been piloting it within their national society um, for eight months now. Uh, Netherlands Red Cross and the British Red Cross are right behind it. In the meantime, we also have it in nine countries with pandemic preparedness and health. So we're going not just from the sectoral topic, but from the organizational topic. And so that's how we're trying to scale. So it, again, so while we have these kind of audiences in terms of trainers, the next level is to get it to like the wider sphere of it. And that's going to be hard, but that's why it's a beta right now, because uh, we're, we're, I'm one person and I have a couple of people and I have ambassadors and we had Dirk come work with us for a while, but beta means that we need to scale to the next level. 
And that means that we've tested and proven with all the pilots this fall that we've, we've got it. We've got it, we've got the, we've got the template and the plan and it's working. Now we just have to like, we have to iterate and kind of codify it. And one last thing on the, on the playbooks, I know I've said a lot of sentences. The reason it's in PDF and Word is because the Nepal Red Cross, who one of my key informants said, what we really want is stuff that can go on a flash drive that I can print and hand out because some branches around the world do not have internet. And frankly, people are far more comfortable if you're talking about data protection in Northern Nigeria, which is what somebody told me. He took a couple of the exercises of thumb protection. He printed out the exercises before they were even in the playbook and did training with the pieces of paper because people were more comfortable with that. And so meeting people where they're at and then working on the critical thinking is how we get to better. Thanks. Great. A lot of sentences. No, that's good. Uh, that's good. And actually, I'm, I'm thinking that it might be, uh, it might be helpful to let some people um, um, ask some questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and and just looking at the list here, um, uh, so just Javier, just wondering um, if we did actually answer your question about um, about uh, social environments and um, outreach to other stakeholders through that, or if there's something more specific we can answer for yeah. you. Yeah. So social. Are, so his question is: When you say co-creation, are you only focusing on one social environment, or is this assumes outreach to other stakeholders? Um, thanks for the question, Javier, and, and nice to see your name pop up. You know, so we, data literacy in, in a large organization, a humanitarian organization, or in all of our sectors, is not going to happen without partners. And so the Red Cross, Red Crescent has partners around the world. We work with UNICEF, we work with, with OCHA, we work in humanitarian conditions, and data, data literacy and the digital divide is real. And um, early on, uh, the Center for Humanitarian Data, which is UN OCHA, they're based in The Hague. Uh, we've been talking about these methodologies. So in fact, there's quite a few exercises that have been piloted in joint workshops with the Center for Humanitarian Data. And they had civic tech communities. They had uh, other humanitarians, not, not just the big INGOs, like the, the big international organizations like OCHA or Red Cross or Crescent. They also had some small civil society and small NGOs in the room. We also invited some university professors and, and some data journalists to join us. What we discovered from these pilots with them, and we've done three so far, and we have some more in the books, is that even though the content we created with the Red Cross in mind, Red Cross Red, Cross, Red Crescent, we found that it was immediately transferable to the larger humanitarian space. And so that's a good win. So that's one lesson. The second lesson is, is that we also created some really good content together. And so that, you know, I tested it and then we kind of went back and forth. And so that's all been labeled in the playbook. And so that shows us that, you know, the way that we get better at data literacy is by finding the best strengths out there and building on each other's teaching methods. So lastly, while the audience for this particular beta is humanitarians, and certainly I have to worry about the Red Cross, Red Crescent, my eye on the prize is a data literacy consortium. I believe that there's lots of super talented people out there, and probably some of you have seen some of the things that you guys have mentioned here. Like the idea is that if we can actually create like a base core curriculum that can be, um, and when I say curriculum, lunch and learns, fun things, nothing at the competency level. I want to make sure that it's very accessible. Um, competency levels come with HR and that's another whole level, right? I'm more interested in the fact that there's great content out there. If we have a place to put it, to white label it and to have people fork and share, um, that's, that's the dream space of the data, data, data playbook, to be honest. The idea that maybe a data, data consortium can help us keep sharing resources. We are not, um, that's not our core competency as the Red Cross Red Crescent to be a data, data folk. Like we're certainly learning, it's certainly responsible, it's certainly important. But what if we have a consortium of academics and people who are creating this stuff who could sustain it and can update it? What other things can we do with a partnership in terms of data literacy? Because I, I have to say, I've been super overwhelmed by governments, donors, development folks, um, people who saw it, uh, like, who were asking me questions, super, super excited about it. And I, so I can send all the people who are working on development to jerk, but it says to me that we have something in terms of the learning style um, that we can scale. And so with the center we've written, and Dirk, we've written out a kind of concept note around the data literacy consortium, and we really want to invite other people to, to join us. Um, maybe I'm going to answer Chuck Tim's question next. Is that all right? Are yeah, I just want to, can, can yeah. we, could I invite Tim just to come off mute yeah. and uh, maybe ask your question? 
Yeah. Yeah, if I hit the button. So I, yeah, so I think I was really interested when you were mentioning working with very different groups across the world, and you touched on it a bit with the group in Nepal already, mm -hmm. the different learning styles, so both yes. translating into different languages, but also yep. when we did research into open data, one thing that really came out was different countries have very different models of mm -hmm. education, professional education. Mm -hmm. Having seen the really fun, engaging activities you run, I think that's how I'd like to learn. But mm -hmm. I'd be curious what you found in across the world, both culturally and also different levels of the organisations. Yeah. Those things you yeah. as yeah. frontline staff. Yeah, and so so again, the content that we have right now is really training materials for trainers. It's kind of a guidance for trainers, and I've seen I've seen people who are running workshops around the world completely change the content. Um, and they take it as a base layer and then they ship it to the audience. And I strongly encourage them to shift it to the audience. And we're very, very interested in getting that translated. In fact, I've had a number of national societies. So we're, we have four official languages, Arabic, French, English, and Spanish. I have also had um, uh, other national societies. I was with 30 national, 28 national societies this fall. And each one of them is offering to translate into their own language. So that's there. So one, in terms of language, we want to get the base content nailed down and then we'll, go, we'll open up the community translation, which is going to happen. Translating the content for different audiences is absolutely on my list. So that's why this year coming up, we're working on data for volunteers. Um, and that's, that's really critical because mobile data collection happens for most programs at IFRC. And, and you know, we want to make sure that we're responsible in data collection and processes. So people are taking the responsible data modules and already embedding them because it's an easy way to do that, but they're tailoring it. So when it comes down to the learning styles, I've heard that sometimes slides don't work, sometimes the games don't work. And, and that's really for the audience to cut the learners to do that. So that by, by putting the content in the way it is, we're also telling the trainers this is how you need to remix and so we're changing how we educate and we're also building on what health is doing because health is doing incredible work about reaching different audiences in different ways um, and that's important but again getting to back to the data literacy consortium that to me is the power of like let's let's roll far, far farther and that can, that's something that ifrc cannot own alone and so that's why we want the partnership to try and um kind of make it so that, you know, if you want to use it for whatever organization you're working with, Tim, today, I understand you wear a couple hats, that you can figure that out. But I think that if we use our best skills, that'll be better, right? And I think that's what, I think that's what the data communities, the civic tech communities have taught me over the years. They're my key influencers. Uh, and, you know, if we can find a way to kind of share that. And I just want to make a quick mention to School of Data, right? I learned quite a bit at School of Data, but I also really wanted to make sure that we had something for the humanitarian purposes. And so I feel like that all that can join up quite, quite well. Yeah. And just to say that, like, you know, we, um, uh, it, similarly to School of Data, in terms of School of Data putting stuff out there that is curriculum, right, that people can can build off of. We've all benefited so much from the School of Data curriculum. And in the same way, right, one thing I really appreciate about the way that the playbook is done now and under Creative Commons and all that, and the way that, that it's getting out in the world is, you know what I mean, we, we can all benefit from it as well, but um, we all also need to think about like, how do we give back and how do we also continue to do shared lessons learned and all that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to answer Javier's question about governments. Yeah, I've yeah. talked to governments. I think that the open data community, um, you know, how we deal with data um, and how we teach it, I think we, we, it would help us to have the on-ramp. And so um, that's why the data for managers, one that we're working on this year with a number of different national societies might actually be helpful. But I've also, I said, as I said, I've been in rooms with governments who, who've heard what I've said and, um, and who are interested in using it for their own upgrades. I think, the best thing I can say about that, if you're looking for a great link, um, you know, Gina Rom Romletti from IBM um, at the World Economic Forum last year, she gave an incredible talk about um, data responsibility and digital upgrade at IBM and that she said every organization needs this. And so that to me is, yeah, no, um, I will put the link in just a bit. Uh, yeah. I'll put the link in it just a bit about IBM because I think that's an incredible thing that we are not alone in this, but we all have to serve our audiences with the budgets and times that we have. But I do think that there's like something to be scaled there for sure. And so if that happens in terms of having a data playbook for governments or for open data, that's fine. But I think we need to approach it a little bit differently. 
and I'm I, I'm really excited about how how fast it's kind of spread through my organization. Um, and that's again because the ambassador layer is pretty heavy. People really see that we can. This is something that anybody in the organization can pick up and co-create with themselves. And that's where the, the you know the what's our solution? I think that's you know there's lots of heavier stuff happening in terms of analytical training and Excel training. There's amazing, highly technical stuff happening in my organization. But I wanted to make sure that we don't leave anybody behind either. And I I, I need to I really need to jump on the yep. Uh, yep. co-creation aspect. Yes, thank you. Um, and and this bit of like so you know what are what are really good lessons learned in terms of that co-creation. Um, and I think for this bit in terms of like, if you're working with governments and one of the things that you went through, Heather, was um, uh, working in a space where the concept of co-creation was not the norm, right? Mm -hmm. people, people weren't that used to it. Um, and uh, one of the things, you know, I'm, I remember during that sprint and also a little bit before the sprint in terms of um, uh, people sort of having difficulty with their ability to connect with the playbook and what it was. It was, it was kind of hard for folks to understand. Once you ha started having stuff that people could see, you know, use, get a hold of, um, it became very different and you started having that much stronger response from people, right? Like, yeah, I think, I think so co-creation happens in different ways in, in, in this humanitarian organization. Um, the terms, and I, I love um, the team, one of the teams that I work as alongside, um, you know, Heather, how you talk about data and technology, how you talk about creation, how you talk about open communities and open organizations, that is a foreign language. So you have to find, and so literally, like while we were creating it, we gave them something palatable that they could print and look at that was in a common template rather than a Google Doc. Yeah, absolutely, they, they got it. But I think it was also about, um, there's four other kind of large kind of co-created projects now. And so the, the, kind of open methodologies we've started to build up. But the idea of doing a, um, an open sprint, um, you know, fast forward, my organization is shifting. And last month, one of my colleagues ran a global right sprint, which is basically like a right sprint for a policy document. And, you know, everybody understood it. And I was like, okay, so there's a bunch of us using these new languages and collaborative methods. And so we're trying to shift our organization to collaborate in a new way. They've always consulted, but now we're changing the dynamic and the innovation team has been key to that. So organizational development takes a long time and you just have to find your allies. Well, but yeah, I'm, definitely can be really hard, especially in and learning the language that everyone speaks. That was rough, right? And trying to match it to what their needs were. Definitely interesting. So I think, and I think one of the things I, I just I wanted to to point out as a learning mm -hmm. was that like if you are in a in a in a place where you're you're starting to do co-creation, and I think this is probably a best practice regardless. Like having something, getting something quickly that you can test, right? Mm -hmm. Having something that you can put in people's hands quickly, yeah. that they can then react to, and also I mean that really critical bit. Like I think that in terms of when the co-created creation magic sauce started was when you, you actually got people to look at stuff and you told them, tell, give us feedback, right? Yeah. Like pick it up, use it, give us stuff back. Yeah. And that's really when you started to see a lot of that really great uptake. Yeah. So I think, I think it's different. Like, and I have to be super clear, like the Geneva office is very different from the rest of the part of the world. And so how we get feedback and how we collaborate has been like a real thing. They're very detail oriented folks and very policy driven, right? So talking about technology and data is just, you know, some of them are really great. Some of them, it's new to them. I did add in, thanks Dirk for mentioning, you know, collaboration. I added in the open organization link. I really love the open organization for how you build based on open principles. Um, um, and I use this at OpenStreetMap, but I also use this at work. And so I've started to use the terms, the articles, and I've started to use it as a socialization point for how do you build collaboration and co-creation. And that's actually been really helpful. I've also found some really good articles on human-centered design, which I like send quite frequently. I'm like, oh, you understand this? So having a set of resources that meets your audience to be able to teach them about these methodologies, I think is important while you invite them to give feedback. I'm just gonna answer Chris's question, if that's all right. So his question is, what are the feedback mechanisms do you have in place for trainers? For trainers? Capturing thoughts, lessons during sessions in real time, following up participants through surveys or vital strategies. 
Okay, I'm going to talk about my colleague Roxanne Moore. Roxanne Moore is one of the most detail-oriented um, healthcare professionals uh, who is also an emergency information manager, which is a hybrid, okay? Um, she did uh, training classes around the world um, and set, sent me a Google Doc with itemized, linked, um, I think it was seven pages pieces of feedback uh, for, for each of the different module items that she used. Plus, she sat down with me and gave me feedback. Then there's Laura Alvarino from the Canadian Red Cross. She's been on the phone with me twice, has given me some rapid feedback about the stuff that she's been doing. And then the people who are in the Cox and Boys are and, 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 and DRC. Just to say that they, um, in terms of feedback, I get emails, I get drive-bys in the hall, I get, um, I, I set up a forum, people don't use forums. Some of my detail-oriented people will come and tell me. I actively, with my colleague Margarita, who's amazing, um, she's very good at curriculum development and she's gonna help us get to beta, get to version one, but she's also helping me with kind of making sure how we follow up. I also wanna say that um, the Prepare Center, uh, which the link is on, I'll, I'll put it, we'll put the link in here shortly or maybe in the follow-up email. The Repair Center tells us that we're the top uh, site there right now because people are downloading and using it, which is exciting. So I just, the more feedback we get, um, the more it is. And so as the, if I know that people are here and you're using it, I definitely want to hear from you. Um, if you're dealing with um, you know, piloting and development groups, I'm going to send you to Dirk. If you're working within humanitarian, then um, definitely myself, but I'll always think with Dirk because, you know, I think we both believe in this kind of consortium idea. So thank you. Very much. Um, we have to, we've, we've been skipping Bob Gradick's question. <gasps> Sorry, what was his uh, question? Uh, it, well, he's, he had said paper is a great way to level the playing field across everyone participating in the activities. Is there anything that you were surprised to learn about that? About paper? No, I, I know that there's a digital divide. Um, I know that not every branch around the world has internet. Um, I personally and again i'm a little bit of a data and digital cowboy that's how i became a i was a volunteer and that's how i became humanitarian right um i've learned that the lowest barrier to entry is the best way to start and so if you make it fun and playful and get rid of the laptops people are super intimidated take them away and have a human conversation that changes everything so i we, we've done a mix so we do this kind of learn by doing uh, feed the data curious activities, and so that's kind of our motto. Um, so learn by doing, feed the data curious, act with the data ready. That's kind of our kind of programmatic model. So we have like the scenarios and sessions that you see in here. We've also interplayed them with data talks about policy or responsible data. That's been really important. Data protection, the handbook on data protection from ICRC. We did a couple of sessions on that topic. We've also done some demos. We've also done some mapathons with missing maps. And so again, like this whole, I like to call it the ABC method, always be charging. So while you have um, the data playbook, it's part of our toolkit, right? It's part of like, we have mapathons, we have talks, we have all kinds of different things. And we follow a general schedule around uh, it. And that's why you need to find out who your informal data working group is in your organization. That's been really core for us. It's in the playbook uh, culture chapter about like find your advocates and get them to help you because this is not going to happen with one person. Great. And I, so two, two more things. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one just, um, and just to, so Tim, I, I, I really appreciate what you wrote in here about there's something really interesting here about bridging the non hierarchical nature of the co creation process and mm -hmm. the ideas of more formal review, risk management, sign off that people may, may be more familiar with. I think one of the things in terms of the co-creation process that is super important is doing that breaking down of hierarchy in terms mm -hmm. of exchanging and sharing knowledge within teams, right? So just to say my theory about what's good about hierarchies is understanding where the buck stops, right? Who is responsible for what? But I think often hierarchies can do us damage in terms of sharing knowledge. So yeah. This is where I really do yeah. like the co-creation process and, um, and think it is really critical. We, we do need hierarchies. We can't, mm -hmm. you know, we, and particularly within organizations and big institutions, we need them. But in order for teams to work properly, they've got to get beyond that in order to share the knowledge. And so that's the power of co-creation. Go ahead. Yeah. If I could, it's co-creation and community building. Those two yeah. things need to be married, married, married. And so just to be clear, before I did the data playbook, I became the town spammer. 
And, and I found out that I'd kind of broken, I'd kind of did something for Voten and I was super excited about it. So and they know this because I'm pretty joyful about it. I sent an all staff email inviting everybody to come and talk about data. Everybody from finance to HR to health across the board. Policy folks, come on over. We're going to talk about barriers, opportunities, what skills you want to learn, and what, what can you offer to teach. Because I wanted to make sure that it was an equal conversation and build a common language. And so that's, that was my gap analysis internally. And so I've done it in 10 places now, 11 places. And so the idea of, uh, you know, whether it be regional offices, national societies, or headquarters, right? That breaking down the hierarchies of, oh, I don't know. I've had people come to me after those sessions and go, I'm so scared. I'm going to not, I don't know how to do this stuff. I've got 30 years humanitarian experience, but I don't know how to use this data stuff, but I'm super intimidated. Thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm less scared now. Like, oh my goodness, data therapy. I'm telling you, you got to really just like be as inclusive. And so this is what I mean about open principles. Be as inclusive as possible in the co-creation of the, the events in the co-creation of the content and in the application of it because there's a lot of people out there that you know they can become amazing advocates if if given that opportunity and that's where the you know taking those principles all the way through everything you do is change things for sure yeah. great so um uh, heidi's final thing here um and and this will be the final thing because we're we are getting close to the top of the hour yeah. But yep. um, could you share some of the human-centered design docs that you especially like? And I'll let sure. you go first if you have any sure. to your head. Sure. So I'm going to put in the links for the Atlassian um, and for the uh, DIY toolkit, as well mm -hmm. the article. From, I, I tried to put in the, the article from, Stan, from Stanford, the research paper on human-centered design. Um, but, you know, I, I, I keep coming back to um, the, the, the kind of two or three different organizations that I learned so much from in terms of co-creation. Um, my friends at Mozilla, you know, MozFest and Mozilla, I learned so much from them about co-creation. Um, Aspiration Tech, you will note that most of the data playbook, and it's credited there, the participatory design model is absolutely Alan Gunn, Aspiration Tech, that whole network, and then Dirk. I mean, I, I can't say it enough about how much fun, and it was super hard for us to try and figure it out because I'm like, we're shipping. He's like, okay, I have some questions. I'm like, no, we're shipping. And so, so we had to learn how to talk with each other. So Dirk certainly had a style of being able to kind of think, um, you know, think about the co-creation in a different way. So just to say that, you know, co-creation comes with thinking about what the best practices are out there. Great. Um, and, and also just to say, so one, and, and I have learned, it's funny, you've, you did my list, um, it, uh, except for one other, just to add, um, Mobilization Lab, um, if you go to their website, they have a resource called Campaign Accelerator, which is actually about design thinking, but putting it into a, uh, a campaigning community organizing frame. Um, and there's lots of really great exercises in there that are helpful not just for campaigners, but lots of different kinds of folks and super practical stuff. To say that, as I've said that, um, what is going to happen with this, um, also in terms of it being a resource, so like I said, the, um, this is being recorded. One of the things that um, uh, then is gonna happen, the, this recording will be available on the, on the interwebs um, and also via the FabWriter site. I am going to be putting together a blog post which will include notes and links to all the resources that have been mentioned, including all those great ones that you guys have just shared on the chat room. I am super grateful for all of that. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so um, uh, I, I do wanna, we should probably wrap. Um, Heather, just any sort of final words of wisdom before I let everybody go? Sure. So first of all, thanks everybody for joining us and thanks Dirk for hosting and thanks for the blog post. I'll need that to manage up. Um, the data playbook is a beta. I'm going to cough one second. Sorry. The data playbook is a beta. If you have feedback and you're using it, please let us know. Um, and we'll keep you know, posted as well about the Data Literacy Consortium because this is going to happen with all of us, I believe. And again, while it's for humanitarians, consider it Creative Commons and white labeled. Um, and take out our examples, put your own in and try it out and then come back and share what your best practices are too. Thanks. Please do that. So great. Thank you. Um, and, and yes. Um. <laughs>
Uh, and also, I, I really, again, thank you everyone for coming today, sharing resources, asking great questions. I've gotten so much out of this last hour, I can't tell you. Um, and it wouldn't have been possible if you guys all didn't show up um, and ask via the various channels. So first, thank you for that. Um, I just want to point out, if you haven't already, please join our Network Centric Resources uh, 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 Network. Um, we do this all the time where we uh, share um, how to do co-creation, how to get uh, resources together that um, uh, share ownership, enable contribution, and support collaboration. So that's a, a good resource. Um, uh, I've mentioned the recording. The last final thing I want to say, we're going to have other online discussions going on in 2019. So that's another reason you want to join the network. Um, in January, I'm about to set the date, um, but our next one will be the mentioned Mozilla Fest. Um, Sarah Allen, the Mozilla Festival Director, um, is going to be our next guest, and she's going to talk about how M MozFest is a collaboration between 2,000 people. Yes, 2,000 people collaborating. That is MozFest. Um, and that's going to be our next one, so stay, stay tuned for that. I've also um, gotten word that Greg Bloom from Open Referrals um, will be doing uh, 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 an online discussion about his open standards and um, um, creating open standards with a community of people that are doing referrals for resources to, for people um, that are in need. So we are super grateful and thankful for that. And so just with that, bye, Heather. Bye, everyone. Thank you. We will be in touch with all these great links. And again, thank you and see you soon. And I'm stopping recording if anyone says anything. Bye.